Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. President Biden voicing support for an independent Palestinian state and giving aid to Palestinians reversing Trump-era policies. Biden is also reversing course on his Saudi Arabia policy, meeting with the kingdom's crown prince today, where he is expected to push for more oil production. Tight races are expected in Maryland's gubernatorial primaries. Four Republicans and nine Democrats are competing for nomination. Another Air Force general is taking command of the Pentagon's F-35 Joint Program Office. What does the change in leadership suggest about the future of the program? President Biden met with the president of the Palestinian Authority today. Biden told him he's committed to a two-state solution. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas welcomed President Biden to Bethlehem in the West Bank Friday. Biden told Abbas that he still backs a two-state solution. My commitment to that goal of a two-state solution has not changed. Remain the best way to achieve uh, equal measure of security, prosperity, freedom and democracy for the Palestinians as well as Israelis. Palestinians want East Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza as part of their state. Despite voicing support for an independent Palestinian state, Biden acknowledged that it remains a distant prospect. There's been no progress in resuming the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which collapsed more than a decade ago. For Abbas's part, he said he hopes Biden reopens the U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem and removes the Palestine Liberation Organization from the U.S. terrorist list. Another issue Biden brought up is the death of Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akla. An empty seat was left for her in the press area. The Palestinian-American was killed in May while reporting on an Israeli raid in the West Bank. It isn't clear who shot her. Biden said the U.S. will continue to insist on a full and transparent accounting of her death. Earlier in the day, Biden visited a hospital in Jerusalem that serves Palestinians. He announced that the U.S. is lending a financial hand to the East Jerusalem Hospital Network. So today... I'm pleased to announce the United States is committing an additional $100 million to support these hospitals. Your staffs and that work for the Palestinian people. The funding subject to approval by Congress. Biden also announced another $200 million in aid to a U.N. agency that supports Palestinian refugees. Since taking office, Biden's reversed multiple Trump policies including suspending aid to Palestinians. Biden also hasn't brought up terrorism in the region. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. More flights to and from Israel will finally be allowed to fly over Saudi Arabia. It comes after the country said it would open its airspace to all airlines, including those from Israel. Some flights to and from Israel previously had to bypass Saudi airspace, adding to flight times and fuel costs. President Biden welcomed the decision. He said it was a key step in building a more integrated and stable Middle East region. Biden is due to visit Saudi Arabia today and become the first U.S. president to fly from Israel to Jeddah. Despite progress on flights, Saudi Arabia still does not recognize Israel. It has said nothing of possible bilateral developments during Biden's visit. President Biden's upcoming meeting with Saudi Arabia's crown prince has drawn backlash over its human rights record. Will human rights be emphasized during the meeting or will oil production be the focus? Here's more. President Biden is scheduled to meet with Saudi Arabia's crown prince Mohammed bin Salman. Bin Salman has been credited for opening up the country and giving women more rights. Gender segregation in many public spaces has been ended and women are now allowed to drive cars. Bin Salman has also allowed concerts and opened movie theaters. At the same time, he killed and imprisoned people critical of the Saudi regime. Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman has engaged in waves and waves of arrests of all kinds of individuals, including intellectuals, uh, clerics, secularists, women's rights activists, human rights activists, you name it. Everybody has been targeted. Anyone who had the capacity uh, to criticize the Saudi authorities has been shut down. However, President Biden previously said that he wants to reorient, but not rupture, relations with Saudi Arabia. His trip to Saudi Arabia also comes as pressure mounts at home over soaring inflation. While Biden insisted he's not there to ask them for oil, U.S. officials do expect oil production to be a topic of discussion. Domestic oil producers aren't happy with the president's trip to the Middle East. 
The president of the American Petroleum Institute says that there's a solution to the oil problem beneath our feet in the U.S. An assistant dean at the New York University's Center for Global Affairs says Biden's visit is a win for Saudi Arabia. It reasserts Saudi's position as sort of the, the linchpin in the region. As for Saudi citizens, many of them support Biden's visit, hoping the relationship between the two countries can improve. As for President Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia, this proves the strength of the position of Saudi Arabia, and it indicates that things are going back to their normal state. Biden is scheduled to participate in a bilateral meeting with the king and the crown prince today. Maryland will hold its primary elections next Tuesday, July 19th. The key races to watch are the Republican and Democratic gubernatorial primaries. Who are the candidates? Let's take a look. Maryland's incumbent governor, Larry Hogan, a Republican, is facing term limits. There are four candidates on the Republican side trying to replace him. But the contest boils down to a two-way proxy battle between Hogan and former President Trump. Hogan has been one of Trump's most outspoken critics from within the Republican Party. He endorsed Kelly Schultz in the race. Schultz has served in Hogan's cabinet as Labor Secretary and Commerce Secretary. And Trump endorsed State Delegate Dan Cox. Cox is an attorney who sponsored a failed bid to impeach the governor in March. This is projected to be a tight race. According to the Maryland State Board of Elections, Cox's campaign raised four times less than Schultz's. But he has received significant publicity boosts from Trump, who has been actively monitoring the campaign. Meanwhile, on the Democratic side, nine candidates are in the race, many of whom are well-funded. But it is Wes Moore, a first-time candidate, who has generated the most excitement. Moore is a Rhodes Scholar, U.S. Army combat veteran, White House fellow, best-selling author, investment banker, and the chief executive of the Robin Hood Foundation. His platform includes combating climate change, promoting abortion, and closing the racial wealth gap. Moore has the backing of Oprah Winfrey, and he's leading in fundraising and endorsements while polling among frontrunners. His campaign has raised more than $2.5 million since January. Other candidates among the top six frontrunners are former U.S. Labor Secretary Tom Perez, Maryland State Comptroller Peter Franchot, former Maryland Attorney General Douglas F. Gensler, former U.S. Education Secretary John B. King Jr., and Clinton White House official John Barron. Three candidates trail behind the top six with little chance to win, but they have great potential to affect who wins with every vote they receive in the crowded race. The Pentagon's F-35 Joint Program Office has a new top official. Another Air Force General, Michael Schmidt, will serve as the executive officer of the program. His succession might signal greater changes for the program office. Here's more. U.S. Air Force Lieutenant General Michael Schmidt was officially sworn in as the new program executive officer of the F-35 Joint Program Office, or JPO. The ceremony was held Tuesday in Washington hosted by Pentagon Acquisition Chief William A. LaPlante. LaPlante called the selection of Schmidt the right person for the job at the right time. Schmidt took command remotely after recently testing positive for COVID-19. According to Air Force Magazine, he is succeeding another Air Force Lieutenant General, Eric Fick. Fick had led the office since 2019. After the handover, Fick will retire from his more than three decades of military service. The change broke a 25-year-old tradition of alternating JPO leadership between the Navy and Air Force. According to Air Force magazine, this might signal the Pentagon's plan to disband the program office. Since both the Navy and Air Force used the F-35 warfighters, the old pattern was designed to ensure the program was as joint as possible. But the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps actually operate different types of F-35s. Thus, the leadership turnover would allow each service to manage its own fleet. Congress also previously suggested an arrangement could significantly reduce the cost of maintaining the F-35s. The Pentagon also said Schmidt's appointment is not temporary. Members of Congress, as well as family and friends, honored World War II veteran Herschel Woodrow Woody Williams at his funeral service at the Capitol on Thursday. With Woody's passing, we have lost a deeply selfless American and a vital link to our nation's greatest generation. His story echoes the service of so many Americans who faced the horrors of war so that liberty might triumph over fascism. Many of them were just 17, 18, 19 years old. They summoned awe-inspiring courage, keeping the flame of democracy burning through our darkest hour. 
Williams was the last surviving World War II Medal of Honor recipient. He died on June 29th at the age of 98. Williams enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps in 1943. During World War II, he served in New Caledonia, Guadalcanal, Guam, and Iwo Jima. In Iwo Jima, he single-handedly operated six flamethrowers for several hours against Japanese forces and ultimately cleared a path for U.S. troops. His actions earned him the Medal of Honor. After the war, Williams worked for what is now the Department of Veterans Affairs for more than 30 years. He later established his foundation and also ran a horse farm. Senator Joe Manchin from Williams' home state of West Virginia called Williams the greatest of the greatest generation. Indiana has filed an emergency application with the Supreme Court, urging it to speed up finalization of its Roe v. Wade reversal. The state wants to enforce abortion regulations put on hold by lower courts. Supreme Court rules say the court's mandate takes effect 25 days after a judgment. That's unless the court shortens the waiting period or the parties involved agree on shortening it. Indiana's attorney general wants to speed up the process so the state can enforce a law requiring parental notification when a court permits a minor to get an abortion. The Indiana solicitor general says the notification requirement allows parental consultation in what may be a difficult and painful moral decision. Chief Justice John Roberts ordered Planned Parenthood to respond to Indiana's request by 5 p.m. Eastern today. 58. That's how many attacks have reportedly occurred against pregnancy resource centers since the leak that Roe would be overturned. Now there is a divide among politicians on whether these centers need to be protected or closed down altogether. We hear from a pro-life activist on the impact these attacks are having on pregnancy centers. Please welcome Christina Bennett, who is a spokesperson for Live Action. Thank you for coming on the show again, Christina. Thank you so much for having me. I would like to start with your reaction to Senator Josh Hawley proposing a measure to help protect churches and pregnancy centers from attacks. I'm very grateful for this measure, and I think that it's long overdue. I'm from the state of Connecticut, and for the past four to five years, our pregnancy resource centers have been fighting negative legislation, accusing them of false advertising. The California pregnancy centers had a Supreme Court case that they had to fight, and thankfully they won, NIFLA versus Becerra. That was a few years ago. So pregnancy centers have been under attack for years from pro-abortion radical groups, and it's important to see senators, state legislators, mayors, representatives, elected officials who are willing to stand up and support them. So this has been happening long before the overturning of Roe, correct? It has been, and some people are not aware of it if it's not happening in their state, but in certain states like Connecticut and California, the pregnancy centers have been harassed and they've been accused of all sorts of wrongdoing when really all they're doing is providing resources to women and families in need. And so it's very sad to see them dishonored in this way. Senator Hawley's bill would make attacks on pro-life pregnancy centers a felony for first-time offenses. Do you think this is justified? And if so, is it enough? I do think it's justified because if you look at what's happening across the country right now, pregnancy centers are suffering hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages. Their windows are being broken, their centers are being burned, they're being vandalized. It's important for people to understand that most of these centers do not get state funding. Very few of them do. The majority of them are raising funds on their own. They're doing baby bottle campaigns, they're doing diaper drives, they're doing partnership things with community members. And so they don't always have the resources to just, you know, rebuild, especially if they're they're struggling in other ways. And so, yes, I do think that it's justified. And I also think that more needs to be done. And I know that some of these pregnancy centers have even had to resort to paint that is graffiti resistant. Yes, it's very sad to see them having to take such measures because again, These pregnancy centers, they're offering free resources to women and families. They're offering parenting classes at no cost. They're offering diapers and baby clothes. They're offering baby showers. They're helping women get jobs and they're helping them get on social services. And for them to have to be protecting themselves in this way, it's just very sad that we've come to this place in our nation. And how do you classify the threats, violence and vandalism against these pregnancy centers since since Roe's been overturned? 
I consider it to be domestic acts of terrorism. I, I consider it to be terrorism against these centers. They are trying to shut them down. They're trying to make them afraid. They're trying to intimidate them. One of the common phrases that they're writing in graffiti over their centers is, if abortion is not safe, then you're not going to be safe either. And that's just, it's a fear tactic. It's a, it's a tactic of terrorism. And what do you make of senators such as Elizabeth Warren who say that these pregnancy resource centers need to be shut down? It's very sad, and I would encourage Senator Warren to visit the centers in her own state. One of the centers in her own state was just vandalized, and I would encourage her to tour them, to talk to the leaders, to look at the work that they're actually doing, to talk to the clients of the centers and ask them, why do you keep coming back? Why do you come to the center? Because if she does, she'll realize that women are freely choosing to come to pregnancy resource centers because they provide resources and support. And I think she would understand better if she was to do that, that her attacks are really ignorant. Christina Bennett at Live Action, thank you so much for your analysis on this. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Still to come, the Jefferson Union High School District in San Mateo County offers housing for its teachers. More school districts could follow amid a national teacher shortage. Stay tuned for more right here on NTD News. Everyone has been found after more than 40 people were unaccounted for in Buchanan County, Virginia, in the wake of severe weather and flooding. Authorities say crews worked overnight and through the morning. The search covered about 30 miles and 400 buildings. All 44 people were accounted for. Crews were out all night last night, and there was five crews out this morning, reaching to those in the flooded area that were reported missing on our hotline yesterday, and they were all located. We also happy to report we are at zero fatalities during this flooding incident. A series of storms partially stalled over the country, county and the wider region of Kentucky, West Virginia and Virginia late Tuesday, dropping between four to six inches of water in a matter of hours. The Jefferson Union High School District in San Mateo County is among just a handful of places in the country that offers teacher housing. More school districts could follow amid a national teacher shortage and rapidly rising rent costs. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. High school teacher Lisa Raskin moved out of a cramped apartment and into her own place this month. She pays $1,500 for the one bedroom with expansive views. It's also within walking distance to work. I don't know why they didn't do it sooner. Um, I think more schools really need to consider doing this or more districts really need to consider this model. Um, I think it shows educators that they value them as educators. I think that this is a good way to retain those educators. The region is exorbitantly priced and hostile to new housing. So the small school district just south of San Francisco opened 122 apartments for teachers and staff. As housing costs rise and school districts are struggling with teacher shortages, more and more are getting interested in, can we build workforce housing? You know, the one thing that school districts have is land. Educator housing complexes are rare, but more places could explore the concept. Teachers can get to know children and their families better if they live close by. But housing development can be politically and financially difficult. I mean, for one, you have a lot of opposition across California to new development, or particularly higher density development. And so right there, you're going to have issues that you're going to have to look into. Um, you know, I think there are other questions of, is it the right role of a school district to own housing and to be a landlord in this way? Taylor Garcia worried she'd never be able to move out of a two-bedroom. She now lives in a three-bedroom with her husband and two children. It has a lot more space, um, more closet space, more space for the kids and their things. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just been so beneficial for all of us. San Francisco Unified School District plans to break ground in August on an affordable 134-unit complex for educators. It could be ready to lease in 2024. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Utah's Great Salt Lake dropped to its lowest level in recorded history this month. The receding shores are punctuating concerns that ecological and economic disaster could await the nearly two million people living near the lake. You shouldn't be able to ride a bicycle across Utah's Great Salt Lake and not get wet. 
But that's unfortunately what University of Utah scientist Kevin Perry can do as he studies the lake's dried out bottom, the water having dropped to its lowest level in recorded history in July, exposing 800 square miles of lake bed, an area larger than the Hawaiian island of Maui. And this exposed lake bed, when the wind is strong and the lake bed is dry, uh, it lifts dust off of this lake bed and pushes it into the surrounding communities. And that is a big problem. The dust clouds are laced with calcium, sulfur, and arsenic, a naturally occurring element linked to cancer and birth defects. Parts of the exposed lake bed are also contaminated with residue from copper and silver mining. If you breathe that dust over an extended period of time, like decades or longer, then it can lead to increases in different types of cancer, uh, like lung cancer, bladder cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and such. For years, water from Utah's Great Salt Lake has been diverted for human consumption, industry, and agriculture. That, combined with a two-decade drought, has heightened concerns that ecological and economic disaster could await the nearly two million people living near its receding shores. Already, the lake's millions of birds are suffering as the disappearing lake robs them of nourishment lower on the food chain. Salt Lake City also depends on the lake economically through tourism, explains Utah State Representative Tim Hawks. It's about $1.5 to $2 billion worth of economic activity, 7,000 jobs spread over five counties. Um, those are all really important. With public awareness and pressure to act growing, Utah Governor Spencer Cox signed into law 11 bills related to water conservation and policy in the last legislative session. Among them is a bill that set up a $40 million trust for the lake, with a quarter of it dedicated to habitat restoration. Good news, hopefully, for this newly hatched American coot chick. Amazon's smart doorbell company Ring admits it has given doorbell video to law enforcement without the owner's consent. The company told Congress in a letter earlier this month. It's happened 11 times so far this year. The letter was made public by Senator Ed Markey's office on Wednesday. In it, Amazon's VP of Public Policy said Ring often makes its own good faith determinations as to whether to provide the surveillance footage. In each of the 11 cases this year, Ring determined police requests met the imminent danger threshold. The company has a policy on whether to provide data to police without a warrant or owner consent. Ring currently partners with more than 2,000 law enforcement agencies and nearly 500 fire departments that can request surveillance data from Ring doorbells. Also in the letter, Ring rejected Senator Markey's request that Ring cameras stop automatically recording audio when they take video footage. A new universal suicide crisis hotline is launching. The phone number is 988 and will be available in every state starting Saturday. Year after year, tens of thousands of people in the U.S. take their own lives. In 2020, the CDC said it happened every 11 minutes. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline will have trained counselors available 24-7. The current number, 1-800-273-TALK, will also remain available for use. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, Italy's prime minister tries to resign, but his resignation is rejected by Italy's president. The government is effectively on pause and waiting for a speech from the prime minister. And a Russian missile strike kills at least 21 people. The Ukrainian president calls it an act of terror. The missiles hit a city of 370,000 people. It's also home to the headquarters of Ukrainian Air Force Command. We'll have all that and more for you after this short break. Larry Elder here, and I've got some great news for you. If you're tired of the censorship in this country, then you're in luck. You can go over to EpicTV.com and watch honest programs that don't spin the facts. EpicTV.com is a brand new, no censorship video platform where you can watch not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great program, wholesome movies that you can watch with your entire family. So head over to EpicTV.com. I'll see you there. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers, cutting through the fog of politics. 
It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American cars? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here, so you are in the know. All right, I'm at the house, and uh, I'm going to head inside. Okay, come on, this door. I'm in the house. What do you see? Uh, let me check the den. Uh, there's nothing in the den. Let me check the kitchen. Uh, there's no one downstairs, it looks like. Wait, what was that? I don't know. Let me let me head upstairs. What do you see? What the? Did you shut this bathroom door? No. Oh sh. What? Yeah, it's not here. What do you mean? The, the gun's not here. What? Where is it? Oh my god. What's going hey, on? Cam. Oh my god. What's going Cameron, on? Cameron, are you in there? Open the door. Cam, please, please, open the door, Cameron. Come on, Cam. Italy's president rejected the resignation of Prime Minister Mario Draghi. That was after a day of political drama that threatened to bring down a national unity government that has been in office less than 18 months. After a day of political drama in Italy that threatened to send its government into chaos, Prime Minister Mario Draghi tried to tender his resignation on Thursday. However, Italy's president rejected Draghi's offer to leave. It's effectively put the government on pause until next week. President Sergio Mattarella asked Draghi to address Parliament to get a clearer picture of what's going on, and Draghi is expected to do that next Wednesday. Draghi had said earlier on Thursday he intended to resign after a confidence vote on his government and its approach to fighting inflation. He won it, but without the backing of the Five Star Movement, a coalition party. Draghi had upped the stakes by saying he would not want to lead his 18-month-old government without Five Star, which itself emerged as the largest party in the last election, 2018. But since then, it has seen defections and diminishing public support. Divisions among Italy's political parties over major issues are only growing worse under the gravity of a general election set for next year. Over 20 people were killed and dozens more wounded Thursday in Ukraine. That's after a Russian cruise missile strike on a quiet city 125 miles southwest of Kyiv. Here's the story. Burnt out cars and rubble lay in the street while workers cleared debris in the Ukrainian city of Vinitsa. Officials here say the city was struck by Russian cruise missiles, killing at least 21 people, including three children. Dozens of others are injured. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky called it an act of terror. The Russian Defense Ministry, which denies deliberately targeting civilians, did not immediately comment on the strike. But a grim search is on for survivors. Emergency services say they're unlikely to find any under the rubble. The attack came a day after a breakthrough in talks between Moscow and Kyiv to unblock Ukrainian grain exports and underscores how far the two sides remain from a peace settlement. Vinitsa, a city of 370,000 people, hosts the command headquarters of the Ukrainian Air Force, according to an official Ukrainian military website. Meanwhile, the United States and 40 other countries have agreed to coordinate investigations into suspected Russian war crimes in Ukraine. They'll be creating an umbrella group for investigations, training Ukrainian prosecutors, and expanding the number of forensic teams operating in Ukraine. With some 23,000 war crimes investigations now open, and different countries heading teams, officials say evidence needs to be credible and organized. Russia has repeatedly denied involvement in war crimes. The Russian Defense Ministry says Russia's proposals on how to resume Ukrainian grain exports were largely supported by negotiators at talks this week, and an agreement is close. Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, and the United Nations are expecting to sign a deal next week aimed at resuming Black Sea grain exports from Ukraine. The ongoing conflict has stalled exports from Ukraine's ports. It has left dozens of ships stranded and some 22 million tons of grain stuck in silos, though some of the grain has gone through export via other channels. For example, a port in Romania has helped.
The Russian Defense Ministry said that work on what it calls the Black Sea Initiative will be finalized soon. The ministry said Russia has proposed measures to ensure the transportation of food to foreign countries, including Russian partners. They said that was to rule out the use of supply chains to supply Kyiv with weapons and military equipment and to prevent provocations. Ukraine and Russia are major global wheat suppliers, while Ukraine is a significant producer of corn and sunflower oil. Czech Prime Minister Petr Fiala disclosed that the EU is readying a seventh package of sanctions against Moscow. However, they won't include curbing imports of Russian gas as it would affect too many member states. What is definitely problematic is to include energy in the sanctions because a rule must be observed that the sanctions must have a greater impact on Russia than on the countries imposing the sanctions. There are countries in Europe which can't get rid of their dependency on Russian energy, even if they are intensively working on it. That we have to have in mind. Russia's scheduled maintenance work on the Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline began this week. The process will last 10 days. The latest EU sanctions are being prepared amid concerns over a possible extension of that timeline. The measures include expanding the list of dual-use items barred for export to Russia. There will also be a ban on the import of Russian gold. Fiala said the Czech Republic has put CEZ, one of Europe's largest energy companies, at the center of its government's energy strategy. The country may separate CEZ's coal and nuclear power plants from renewable resources. The prime minister also said the idea of windfall taxes is on the table. Those taxes would target companies that are profiting from energy prices pushed up by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia is attacking Ukraine, and some think that Moldova could be on Putin's radar as well. Today, Germany pledged not to abandon the small Eastern European country, but support it. Germany and the EU will keep supporting Moldova despite pressure from Russia. That's what Germany's foreign minister said today. The minister says it's one of the EU's principles not to leave alone any country in a situation like this, no matter how small it is. Germany pledged $40 million in direct support to Moldova. The minister spoke at the Moldova Support Conference in the country's capital. The main focus of the conference was on helping Moldova to provide accommodation and basic necessities to refugees from Ukraine. Other topics are energy issues, support for the rule of law, improved border management, and economic resilience. Two World War II mass graves were discovered at a forested site 100 miles north of Warsaw. Inside were the ashes of some 8,000 poles. The two pits are about 10 feet deep each. The weight of the ashes totals at least 17 tons. Experts say most of the victims were inmates of the Sodau Nazi Germany Nazi German prisoner camp in Poland. 30,000 people were held there under the Nazis' plan of extermination. The victims were killed in the Nazis' forest executions between 1940 and 44. With attempts to cover up their crimes, the Nazis later covertly burned the bodies and planted trees over the burial pits. They used other prisoners, mainly Jews, to carry out the cover-up. These prisoners were also murdered. The exact location of the mass graves and the number of victims were not known until now. The European Union decides to sue Hungary over a law the country implemented aimed at protecting minors from LGBT content. It's the latest clash of values in the European Union. The lawsuit adds to a list of bitter standoffs between Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban and core EU members. The case relates to a law Hungary enacted last year. He banned the use of materials that were seen as promoting homosexuality and gender change in schools. The Orban government touts the law as protecting children. The prime minister presents himself as a defender of traditional family values. The law was criticized by some groups and watchdogs as discriminating against LGBT people. The EU executive has withheld billions in aid to Hungary. They say it's over disputes related to homosexual issues as well as disagreement over the country's media and courts. The Argentinian police arrested a man on suspicion of extremist, radical, and xenophobic behavior after receiving evidence from the FBI. 
The 23-year-old suspect was arrested in Escobar, Buenos Aires province, on charges of public intimidation. It comes after an investigation carried out by the FBI that started in April 2021. The American Bureau captured internet conversations in which users discussed carrying out violent acts and being willing to sacrifice themselves for the cause, showing radical, extremist, and xenophobic ideas. That's according to the Argentinian Federal Police. Those conversations involved an, inclu- involved an Argentinian IP address. The Argentinian police investigations were led to a user named Depressed Killer who was finally arrested on Thursday. A handgun and ammunition, along with devices, were seized. In 2009, the arrested man checked in a mental health hospital in Escobar. Just ahead, the president of Sri Lanka officially resigns. He had already fled the country and submitted his resignation via email. Protesters also demand that the acting president resign. Does Sri Lanka's biggest lender and creditor China have a plan to trap this country into huge debts to make it hand over a very critical port? Find out more after this break. Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaksa submitted a letter of resignation on Thursday, hours after fleeing to Singapore following mass protests over an economic meltdown. Celebrations broke out on the streets of Colombo after the resignation of Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Protesters had massed outside the presidential secretariat, defying a citywide curfew. According to a spokesperson, Rajapaksa submitted his resignation by email late on Thursday, hours after he fled to Singapore following mass protests over an economic meltdown. It would be official on Friday once the document is legally verified. Protests against the economic crisis have simmered for months and came to a head last weekend when hundreds of thousands of people took over government buildings in Colombo. They blame the Rajapaksa family and allies for runaway inflation, shortages of basic goods, and corruption. Rajapaksa had promised to resign by Wednesday, stirring renewed uncertainty in crisis hit Sri Lanka as the deadline passed. And his decision to make his ally, Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe, the acting president, sparked more unrest. With demonstrators storming parliament and the premier's office demanding that he quit too. Protesters say they'd have no problem with an elected president. We have no problem with who the next elected president is, but if it's going to be Ranil Wickremesinghe who's elected, we would love to know who in parliament voted for a man whose party got only 225,000 votes, and yet he is going to control 22 million people. We will have to question if parliament is a place where the views of the people are taken into consideration. It means that members do not understand the demand of the people for change, and that the people are suffering. Parliament is expected to name a new full-time president on July 20th. Sri Lanka's prime minister was officially sworn in as acting president in a ceremony on Friday. That's according to the prime minister's office. He had already been serving as acting president after the actual president fled Sri Lanka on Tuesday. The president's resignation was formally accepted by the speaker of the parliament early Friday. Sri Lanka's geopolitical value has not only brought opportunities, but also China's attention. By expanding its control in the Indo-Pacific region, China absorbed Sri Lanka into its Belt and Road Initiative. Now Beijing has become the country's biggest lender. Next, we take a closer look at how Sri Lanka found itself in this situation and how it might dig itself out from under a mountain of debt. Sri Lanka is located at a crucial junction, deep within the Indo-Pacific region. First of all, let's look at its transportation value. A port in the country called Hamban Tota sits less than 10 miles away from one of the world's busiest shipping routes and oil transport routes. The path links two of the world's most important oil transit choke points, the Strait of Hormuz and the Strait of Malacca. What's more, it's a deep water seaport, making it an ideal harbor for large warships. The value of that geography has drawn Chinese attention. Beijing wasn't subtle about its interest in the port either. A former Sri Lankan official told the New York Times that Chinese officials had said they expected Sri Lanka to let them know who is coming and stopping there. 
On top of its prime location, Sri Lanka is just a few hundred miles away from the shores of India, a major rival to China. In 2014, China looped Sri Lanka into its Belt and Road Initiative, a controversial project that critics call Beijing's debt trap diplomacy. Under the initiative, the Chinese regime offers billions of dollars in loans to developing countries earmarked for building up their infrastructure. But when countries fail to pay back the money, the regime takes control of their strategic assets, like ports that could prove useful for military purposes. In Sri Lanka's case, Beijing funneled billions of dollars into the country to help build up the Hambantota port. But the South Asian country was later forced to hand over control of the port to China on a 99-year contract after it failed to pay back its Chinese debt. Fast forward to today, Sri Lanka is facing a debt crisis, but some countries are lending a hand. Washington announced $120 million in grants for small and medium-sized enterprises in Sri Lanka. G7 member nations also voiced plans to help relieve Sri Lanka's debts. Neighboring India offered even more financial help. India has pledged over $4 billion in loans. It's also mulling over the possibilities of additional support, like a 500 million credit line for fuel. Comments from an international affairs expert may shed light on India's generosity. He says the country hopes to decrease Beijing's hold on Sri Lanka. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced that the country will hold a state funeral for former leader Shinzo Abe this fall. During a press conference on Thursday, Kishida renewed his condolences. He added that Abe made great achievements in many fields for the country. Kishida condemned the manner of Abe's death and said his passing received an outpouring of condolences at home and from the international community. Kishida said a state funeral would allow for mourning and reflect Abe's determination to protect democracy without giving in to violence. Abe died last Friday after being shot while giving a campaign speech. In Japan, a state funeral is a national ritual. Japan's public broadcaster, NHK, reported that only one state funeral had been held since World War II. That was for former Japanese Prime Minister Yoshida Shigeru, who died in 1967. South Korea hopes a high-level visit to Tokyo will kickstart talks aimed at a breakthrough in historical disputes. The country also has concerns that the death of Shinzo Abe could change Japan's policy priorities. Relations between the two North Asian allies of the U.S. have been strained over disputes dating to Japan's 1910 to 1945 occupation of Korea. Washington has pressed Tokyo and Seoul to mend relations in the face of North Korean nuclear threat and Beijing's rising influence. Officials in the administration of the new South Korean president have vowed to improve ties with Japan. The South Korean foreign minister will visit Japan this month. He'll meet his Japanese counterpart and discuss relations between the two countries and issues on the Korean Peninsula. The Korean foreign minister will also pay respects to former Japanese Prime Minister Abe. A South Korean official said the Korean president would also likely use his August 15th speech marking Korea's independence from Japan as a chance to send a reconciliatory message to Tokyo. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, the Supreme Beef Champion is announced at the Great Yorkshire Show, one of the biggest agricultural events in England. Researchers undertake a five-year project examining hundreds of thousands of artifacts found in shipwrecks. There are thousands of ceramics up to a thousand years old. We'll have all that and more for you right here on NTD News. We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The Epoch Times is independent. We're not controlled by any special interest and we never will be. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit a battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today to our digital edition at theepochtimes.com and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. Read the difference on all your devices. We'd love to have you on board.
court packing. It's the tool of left-wing authoritarians. Hugo Chavez packed Venezuela's Supreme Court with his socialist cronies, paving the way for his tyrannical regime. Now America's socialist radicals want to pack our Supreme Court with four new liberal justices. Court packing is a coup to take away your constitutional freedoms and to turn America into a socialist country. Don't let them destroy our great republic. Go to supremecoup.com to learn more. I love you! At the Great Yorkshire Show in Northern England, champion cattle took part in the Grand Parade with one taking the crown as the Supreme Beef Champion. NTD's Jane Worrell has more for us. The Supreme Beef Champion goes to this British blonde breed. She leads a parade of around 150 cattle in the main ring, one of the highlights of the Great Yorkshire Show. Among them is this distinctive breed, a favorite for many, the Highland. This is the Charolais, marking its 60th anniversary this year, as well as the Shorthorn, which marks its 200-year anniversary. The Shorthorn breed is native to Durham in the northeast of England. We caught up with some board members from the Shorthorn Society before the parade. The Shorthorn herd book was set up by a gentleman, Mr Coates, set up the herd book 200 years ago, and that was the first recorded breeding of cattle as a breed society. And so that's why the Shorthorn is the longest recognized breed of cattle in the world. It's a breed that's brought farmers more than just business. I've fallen in love with the breed. Dad's passionate about the breed. My kids are really involved in the breed and my son James is taking a lot of the decisions, the breeding decisions now. It's given me a network of friends that I wouldn't have had. So as much as it's about making money and, and, and we sell bulls and females, um, to make money, we're in the business to make money. It's about that wider network and what that breed has given me as a person and, and can, continues to give people. Um, we had 70 kids taking part in our stock judging yesterday out in the, in the ring there. To see the next generation coming through is really inspiring. And that, yeah, from, from the, me and myself and the other board members sitting there, it really it pushes us on to, to make sure that we, yeah, we continue to develop the breed for everyone else. And this is one aspect of, of the breed, um, show, the showing side of things, but for me the highlight would be going out on an early Sunday or Saturday morning with nobody about, um, just walking through my cattle and spending time with them. His son works on the breed too. I think a few years ago there would have been, a lot of people would have gone for the more continental breeds, so your Simmentals and your Limousins and your Charleys, and I think now people are starting to see that with the price of fertiliser and the price of feed going up so much, you know, an easy fleshing cattle beast like a short horn that can do it off grass is it's going to be a lot more profitable in the future. The Grand Cattle Parade will be back in the main ring on Friday afternoon when the dairy champion will be revealed. Jane Worrell, NTD News, Harrogate. Indonesian waters are filled with treasures. Now researchers at Adelaide's Flinders University have begun a five-year project examining hundreds of thousands of artifacts found in shipwrecks. They hope to discover new insights about the trade routes that connected Southeast Asia with the rest of the world for hundreds of years. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. From the great empires of Southeast Asia, this is a collection like no other. With the collection that we're working with in Indonesia and here in Australia, no, there's nothing really comparable. There are thousands of ceramics, up to a thousand years old. They've been recovered from shipwrecks deep in Indonesian waters. Their exact origins is a mystery researchers are now hoping to solve. This collection uh, tells the story of global trade and global identity in what some people call the age of commerce. The ceramics were made in China, Vietnam and Thailand. They were traded for spices, textiles and other exotic riches. At one point in the, uh, the 14th and 15th century there's said to be a ban on charter trading and so this is when countries like Thailand and Vietnam stepped up 
and started making their own blue and white or their own replicas of blue and white to try and fill that market. This isn't your average dining room set. There is an artistry to them, and crustaceans are still attached to some of these pieces. These ceramics paint a detailed picture of what the world looked like hundreds of years ago. These objects were salvaged and dispersed without recording their original archaeological find spots. And so it's a rare privilege to try and reconnect them with the places that they came from and discover their real cultural value. Prominent Adelaide lawyer Michael Abbott QC donated the artifacts. He's collected them since the 1960s. The archaeologists now examining the treasures plan to return them home when they work out where that is part of a mission to bring stories of ancient civilizations back to life. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Amid the thousands of treasures in the Cincinnati Art Museum's East Asian art collection, a small bronze mirror always seemed rather unremarkable. Look closely. You can see an image of a Buddha surrounded by rays of light. The mirror dates back to the 15th or 16th century, but it has been sitting in storage in the museum until someone started researching so-called magic mirrors. Those are rare ancient mirrors that, in a certain light, reveal images or patterns hidden on their reflective surfaces. After playing around with light, this mirror showed off its own magic. And on the back, if you know where to look, that's where the design is, along with an inscription spelling out who was depicted. Buddha Amitabha, an important figure in various schools of East Asian Buddhism. This discovery makes the museum one of only a handful of institutions in the world to own a magic mirror. The 18th edition of the World Athletics Championships begins in Eugene, Oregon today. This is the first time the event has been held in the United States. Here are the details. Preparations for the World Athletics Championships are underway at Oregon's Hayward Field Stadium in Eugene. The sports leaders are banking on it, causing a stir in the host country. The stadium is newly rebuilt and can fit over 12,000 people. The U.S. has been a dominant superpower in track and field for more than a century, but has never really taken the sport to its heart in terms of live attendances, TV audiences, or media coverage. Thousands of tickets have yet to be sold. This will be Team USA sprinter Allison Felix's last world championships before she retires. 36-year-old Felix is the most decorated woman in track, having won 11 Olympic medals and 18 world championships medals. Felix is widely expected to run the 4x400m mixed relay on Friday. Her teammate Noah Lyles also expressed confidence in his upcoming races. Lyles says he believes that the 4x100m relay team could set a new world record. This is a story of a black bear who got into a backyard fish pond to cool off from the summer heat until the resident koi fish scared it away. The bear entered the pond in the Massachusetts town of Pepperell, panting heavily. It soaked its fur into the water and quenched its thirst as koi fish darted around it. Footage from a security camera shows the bear flinching and looking into the water warily. That's as the large, colorful fish darted around. Contact with the fish was too much for the bear, and it lumbered away less than a minute and a half after it got into the pond. The homeowner says the bear got into the pond after making a visit to his vegetable garden. The bear visited the backyard shortly after the homeowner's tiny dog got back into the house. Bears have repeatedly come to cool off in the fish pond in the summer. Other wild animals also make frequent visits to the backyard. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email address on screen. We'd love to hear from you. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.